to overtake Rockefeller as the richest man in the country, Carnegie can't just be a profitable steelmaker. He's got to be the most profitable. And for that, he needs an edge. He sets his sights on a struggling steel mill outside Pittsburgh, with plans to make it the largest in his steel-making empire. Carnegie invests millions, retooling the plant to turn out more structural steel than any other mill of its size. The Homestead Steelworks is a true modern marvel. But it can't operate without manpower. One of the huge costs in a steel mill was labor. Carnegie knew that to stay profitable. He had to keep costs low. And the only way to keep costs low was to reduce wages and increase working hours. To keep profits growing, Carnegie needs to continue cutting costs, including wages. But he's also determined to repair his image, something he can't do in the midst of a labor dispute. So he turns to his chairman to do the dirty work. Henry Frick has never been concerned with what people think of his methods. He's about one thing, winning. Carnegie didn't enjoy being a bad guy, being a villain. Frick didn't seem to mind. Frick begins squeezing all that he can get out of the workers at Homestead. Frick decided that the only way to keep the plant running efficiently was with a 12-hour day, six days a week. What that meant was intolerable working conditions. No one could work 12 hours a day. If you're working in an office, you fall asleep at your desk. If you fall asleep in a steel mill, you end up dead. You know, back when Carnegie was building his empire, obviously the, there were no labor laws. It was, it was a free-for-all. And looking back, it seems horrific in a lot of different ways that workers were taken advantage of. But that was the game that was played back then. The conditions are dangerous. How many friends? And a small group of men bands together to raise their concerns. Many of the workers at the steel mill felt that uh, change in working conditions was a necessity. They were exhausted, and they wanted wages that were livable. Unions are relatively new in America, and Frick isn't about to let them take root on his watch. But before acting, he seeks his boss's counsel. Dear Andrew, it may become necessary to fight it out this summer. Once got into, it will be fought to the finish. Andrew Carnegie is well aware of Frick's aggressiveness. It's why he's put 3,000 miles between them. But Carnegie would rather leave some things unsaid. Mr. Frick, 
No doubt he will get Homestead right. You can get anything right. With your mild persistence. His love and mercy help you. May the Lord free you from sin and save you and raise you up. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Accidents on the plant floor keep multiplying until one proves fatal. The death has the potential to unite the overwhelmed workforce. Frick knows what's coming. Dear Andrew, I'm not prepared to believe we will win without a severe struggle. I regret to say it does not seem that there is any other course open for us. We would better make the fight and be through with it. One thing we are all sure of, no contest will be entered into that will fail. We all approve of anything you do. We are with you to the end. Knowing his boss has his back, Frick throws the first punch. He tells workers that Carnegie Steel won't negotiate and conditions won't be improving. Frick didn't understand that the steel workers believed that the mill belonged to them. They were the ones who made the steel. You know, it was their plant. And they weren't going to let this nasty little Frick take it from them. Under the management of Mr. Frick, the Carnegie Company has wiped out organization in the Edgar Thompson Works, has wiped out organization in the Coke region, and are about to wipe out organization in Homestead. No! The time has come to send Mr. Frick a message. That's right. We do not accept the new pay scale. No. We do not accept the poor working conditions. No. We do not accept the long hours. No, no. And why can we do this? Because we are a union. Yeah! And nobody, nobody will break us. Yeah! All those in favor of striking, raise your hands. Frick. I'm giving you one more chance to call off this strike. I'll make sure any man who walks out never returns. We'll see.
2,000 steel workers barricade the front of the plant to prevent Frick from bringing in replacements. The fight has turned personal. But Frick isn't about to back down. He calls in reinforcements. For years, the Pinkerton detectives have been a private police force, best known for tracking down train robbers. They even stopped a plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln and were hired as the president's personal bodyguards. But now they've become an army for hire. With more men and guns than the US military. If you have the money, They'll fight for you. And Frick has the money. We'll enter by the river. Take them by force, if necessary. Remember your training. Follow orders. If they start shooting, we'll hit them back hard. There is no place for cowardice. The Pinkertons were mercenaries. They were from out of town. They had no ties to Pittsburgh, no ties to these workers. They were paid a wage to wield their clubs. The moment Frick made the decision to bring in Pinkertons, the die was cast, and the only way this strike was going to end was in track. Two thousand men barricade themselves inside the homestead plant. Causing steel production to grind to a halt. Carnegie Steel's chairman, Henry Frick, is in no mood to negotiate. Under pressure to quell the revolt, Frick brings in the Pinkertons, a mercenary army capable of outgunning the US military. And their presence threatens to be the spark that lights the powder keg. Frick thought to himself, when the workers see the Pinkertons, when they see that I'm not gonna back down, they will back down. He thought a show of strength, a show of resolve, was all that was needed. And that would be the end. He badly miscalculated. Go ahead, keep going. Hold your ground. Stay calm. Stay calm. We're here to take possession of this property. No! I suggest you turn around and go home. You're not getting in. If you do not stand aside, we will mow every one of you down. The blood of innocent men will be on your hands. Tear down this barricade! Fire! 
When the fighting stops, nine Carnegie steel workers lie dead, while countless others sustain severe injuries. But they manage to hold their ground until Pennsylvania's governor sends in the state militia to finally restore order. Homestead is back in the hands of management. But Andrew Carnegie's problems are far from over. The public is outraged over the violence, blaming Chairman Henry Frick directly. Carnegie extends his stay in Scotland hoping the distance will allow the controversy to blow over. But American reporters track him down. Excuse me, just, uh, just a word. Uh, no, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Carnegie, our reader. Another no. time, gentlemen. Just, one just a word. word. I'm not just in the word. habit of giving interviews in the middle of public parks. Uh, Mr. Carnegie, what? Get out of my damned way. While Carnegie's hounded by press abroad, at home, the public's outrage is escalating. A new group is emerging, calling themselves the anarchists. Known for their violent tactics, they are beginning to strike out whenever and wherever they see injustice. Now they've turned their attention to the massacre at Homestead, demanding payback. Their target is the chairman of Carnegie Steel. Henry Frick is determined to get steel production back up to speed. But his enemies have other plans. Mr. Frick. Yeah. <laughs> 